tuning in um, a little late today. Um, so once again, good evening, relatives. Thank you um, for joining us this evening in our final panel of this teaching series um, with these native, wonderful uh, native, native leaders. Uh, before we get started, I would like everyone to please acknowledge that wherever you are tuning in from within Turtle Island, that you are on native land, our ancestors pre-exist so-called America. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce myself, and then I'd like to introduce our panelists. She'e ya Talia Boyd and Shea, Torich Eatney and Shlin, Toy Haglini Bushes Chin, Ash Chee Desha Chee, Do Tabaha Desha Nella, Akut Ao Dene Asa and Shlin, Nat Nejoja Esha Hawan. Greetings, relatives. My name is Talia. I am from the Dene Nation, born and raised on the Res. I am the Cultural Landscapes Program Manager for the Grand Canyon Trust, and I'm very honored this evening to welcome uh, Davina Smith. Davina is Dene and a board member of the Grand Staircase Escalante Partners and a tribal coordinator and organizer for the National Parks Conservation Association. Hi, Carlton, thank you for joining us. Um, excuse me, um, she's including, she's also a co-founding member of Women of Bears Ears. Her personal mission is to advocate for native families and preserve and protect the cultural and natural resources of ancestral Native American lands. She currently serves as the vice president of Indigican and the chief executive officer of Hesea Native Initiatives LLC. I hope I said that right, <laughs> Davina. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Next, I would like to welcome Ms. Regina Lopez White Skunk, who was born and raised in southwestern Colorado and is a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe of Towak. In 2013, she was elected to serve as a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Council. She is a former co-chair for the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition and education director for the Ute Mountain Ute Museum in Montrose. <clears throat> Regina currently serves on the Telluride Institute Board, Tory House Press Board, the Southwest Utah Wilderness Alliance, Great Old Boards Council of Advisors, and an advisor to the Women of Bears Ears. Uh, and recently joined the staff of the Montezuma Land Conservation Conserv Conservancy as the cultural cross-cultural program manager. Thank you so much for joining us, Regina. Next, I'd like to welcome Mr. Carlton Boacati. Carlton is the Lieutenant Governor for the Pueblo of Zuni and is a representative for the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. He is a uh, U.S. Army Infantry veteran who served three tours in Iraq and was awarded the uh, Notorious Service Medal and Army uh, com com Commendation Medal and the Iraq Campaign Medal. Excuse me, um, I'm, I'm tripping on my words here. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I am very honored to have all our wonderful Native leaders and panelists this evening um, who have done tremendous work, again, um, around both Bears Ears and Grand Staircase uh, National Monuments. And so this evening, and just to provide a little context, we will be talking about um, envisioning futures for both the Bears Ears and the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments. And so tonight we bring together the many learnings and lessons of the past month to discuss how tribal consultation is playing out in the context of both of the monuments. <clears throat> As we wait on the restoration and the expansion of the National Monuments, also, what forms of consultation and co-management might be realized in these spaces? Uh, we close out our teaching series with deep, deep appreciation to all the many individuals doing the outstanding work across the board um, to incorporate meaningful um, consultation and to incorporate the tribe's voices and our values and our rights when it comes to land use and um, land management practices. So thank you all for joining us this evening. And I'm very excited again to dive into this discussion this evening. Um, we have a, a quite a few questions and we have about an hour and a half. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And um, I'm gonna ask Regina to kick us off with the first question and then we'll go, we'll go around. Um, so question number one, Regina, uh, what are some of the key takeaways and lessons learned from the efforts leading up to the designation of the Bears Ears National Monument and its original collaborative management model. And then a, 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 a little mini question on top of that is um, what aspects of this model, are aspects of this model transferable to other settings? Thank you. Again, thank you for um, the honor of 
of being able to speak with such a um, honorable panel here this evening. And, and thanks for all those um, that are here this evening. But utmost, I do want to say thanks to our creator for giving us this time and space together and that we may all continue to speak our truths in the manner that we were chosen to share. So thank you. Thank you, creator. Some of the main takeaways that um, led up to the, the designation, I know that one of the biggest ones, which was the heart and the center of the, of the whole movement was the, the simple act of healing. And that healing had to begin from a very, very nucleus place within ourselves and bleeding out to other tribes that um, would be joining us in this work. And those five tribes were, were a phenomenal group. And as we all learned very quickly, yes, we were all sitting at the table, but historically we all had our own differences and disputes um, in, this, in and around this same space that, that we are speaking and have sought protection for. So the sense of healing really was the center and, and the, the chief motivator that would help continue to, to help us move these conversations forward. The others was learning about one another in a sense that we would be able to, to move this, this type of work. And as indigenous people and as, as a former leader, there was something that kind of struck me that was hugely needed in this conversation. And that was the simple fact that we all need each other. We all need to work with one another. And where a lot of this was going to come from was a lot of our guiding principles that our elders and ancestors had built into a lot of our discussions. These discussions, how are we ever to know, would become so pivotal, pivotal with us pursuing this conversation with elected leaders in the sense outside of our tribal communities and our indigenous groups. Who would have ever guessed that some of the key takeaways would be just being able to lay down those very strong historical enemy ties and sit down with those people that have impacted and have really affected today's existence of our people. When you look at all the atrocities, all the massacres, um, all the policies that led to some astronomical experiences of our, our parents and grandparents, you know, we think about why would we want to sit down with people that have inflicted so much pain and have inflicted so much that we have to live with today. The biggest reason is we have to work together as something that my grandmother always impressed upon me was no matter how you feel about another person, somewhere down the road, you are going to have to need them in conversation, in negotiation, and in support. And so one of the things that I think many of us learn very quickly is that we have to learn to forgive ourselves so that we can forgive others and move past all of the atrocities and the pain that have been his historically inflicted upon our people. And now we are put on a curve, a, a huge learning co curve of learning systems, systems of the federal government, learning about historical policies that led us through these systems. How do we maneuver them? And how do we take an inventory of federal policies and, and put them into a tool bag that we can begin to pull from and as indigenous people can learn to use these same types of tools to help protect and continue to have, have us or allow us to have access to these sacred and important sites. So some very key basic elements were taken from the original movement for Bears Ears. So I think that one of the things that, um, what, what was the other question? Tell you on top of the <clears throat> uh, what are as um are aspects of this model transferable to other settings? Yes, yes. I think every aspect of that learning to forgive of oneself so that we can forgive of others 
can help us maneuver a lot of the many different relationships. And as we see today within even our nation here, we are a diverse group of people, a diverse, a diverse population. We do need to figure out how to forgive so that we can forgive others and move forward into a more gracious time and, and learn to maneuver even the systems that are impacting us on the front of, of the, even the pandemic. So I think that there's a lot of what we've done that we based upon our traditional um, and guiding principles of our people really are so basic that anybody could pick them up and utilize them in a good way. Absolutely, and that's the beauty of um, the tribes coming together with, with around Bears Ears, right? It was, I mean, this was really one of the first times oh, tribes had come together and really uh, buried the hatchet, so to speak, right? And put aside a lot of this historical tension because we understood that our values across um, Indian country were very similar as far as sacred land protection, as far as um, revitalizing our cultural identity. And knowing that we have these traditional knowledge systems that really um, benefit the natural world, right? And as indigenous peoples, uh, we hold that knowledge and that power. And so we do have that responsibility um, as stewards. And I think that's something that also resonates across Indian country is that we all have that responsibility and we see that you know, um, as we do our work. And so this is something that I, I absolutely appreciate um, from the Bears Ears tribes that came together and really um, set an example and um, for the rest of the, for the rest of us to really understand where the healing needs to happen too, right? Like you said, that was the biggest, um, I think, goal. And one of the, the goals that continue to lead the work is that um, healing is, um, needs to happen, right? And it's a, a continuing healing that needs to happen. Thank you very much, Regina. That was, that was very insightful. Um, I wanna go ahead and, and switch gears and I want to switch over to Carlton. Um, Carlton, what are some of the current challenges to meaningful tribal engagement at Bears Ears and Grand Staircase? And uh, what changes occurred with regard to Bears Ears collaborative management model during the Trump administration? Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Carlton. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I coughed earlier, so I want to make sure I didn't get that. Uh, no, thank you, Talia, and um, thank you uh, um, for putting together this presentation, and uh, thank you, Regina, for providing the overview. Um, when we look at the meaning behind collaborative management and, and healing as tribes, and partially as individuals, I think um, throughout our journey together, um, myself and Regina, we definitely uh, I think we can definitely sense in each other a different kind of uh, a spirituality, I guess, if you will. Um, I know for a lot of my work, um, being on the ground turns it from being the theoretical, you know, government type work, you know, tribal leader type work to actually seeing and effectuating what it is that my elders say is our way of life. And when, when what that realization did for me, and it did begin at Bears Ears, um, I speak to a, a cultural leader that's passed on, but he is really my introduction back into how to be Zuni. And what I mean by that is um, I went to school, most of my schooling was probably um, Christian based. And then when I came back to the reservation, it always felt a little different. Um, going into the military, uh, doing my tours of service in, in Iraq, three tours, um, eight and a half years in that kind of setting, coming back and seeing exactly what my people need. And I think what I'm looking at is that sense of identity. And, the, and really, that's the heart of it, I guess, for myself, is to make sure that our children understand um, what Bears Ears and other ancestral ties are. It's, 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 they are the existence of what our elders wanted. To be able to not only exist and, and survive something like COVID, but to try to effectuate uh, our language and our ways of life even with the hardships of, of modern modern day, right? So when we look at the challenges that we face as um, the Bears Ears Commission under President Obama, 
you know, when the Bears Ears National Monument was created under President Obama's proclamation, they did create the Bears Ears Commission. And the Bears Ears Commission was identified to work with the federal agencies on what the collaborative, collaborative, management, collaborative management should look like. And in that process, we always saw the need to have tribal tools as coalition have our own tools. So that way, as it states in the proclamation, that whether it's the Barriers Commission, that there will be a comparable entity that could take over that position if whatever reason it became dissolved. So when we were immediately faced with um, a retraction or at least a, a new Trump executive order under President Trump um, that reduced the Barriers National Monument into two separate uh, smaller monuments, and now identify that those monuments would have a, a, um, a, a FACA group, Federal Advisory Committee Act type of group that would, that included, um, what was the wording, um, two persons of tribal interest. Now you have an entity, Barriers Coalition, Barriers Commission, comprised of five sovereign governments and their appointees, whether they're elected officials like myself or whether they're um, nominated and appointed by um, the Navajo Nation president. You know, we have Mr. Hank Stevens, um, as well as a couple individuals from the Navajo Nation that are appointed to serve in that capacity. Um, and in that regards, that was really, I think, an attack on, on what we were trying to accomplish. We go from a healing aspect and being able to speak about collaborative management to being on the defensive posture and having to go into litigation mode. That immediately put, you know, um, a lot of barriers, put a lot of advocacy. Uh, I, I guess when when we look at governments and we're looking at litigation, we're always trying to be careful. And what we had on our the benefit on our side was, of course, the strength of our voice um, and the fact that we had already laid this out in our proposal. The things that we speak to are not new. The things that we try to speak to and continue to advocate for are embedded within our proclamation of President Obama. So some of the things that we continue to work for are still there. We just had to take a different form. And what I mean by that is when the Barriers Commission became under threat under a new um, Trump proclamation, we reverted back to the Barriers in the Tribal Coalition, where we as sovereign governments could retain our tribal sovereignty and continue to work on advocating for this landscape we know collectively the Barriers National Monument. For Zuni, um, we, we, we have a different name for it. We call it Fish Sun Queen, Pian, the Yala, now the Blue Mountains to the North. But collectively, because we joined this effort, we recognize Bears Ears as that rallying call, if you will. So in that regards, those are what we kind of identify as our own cultural sensitive, our own cultural healing um, within the coalition. So as I mentioned, one of the things that we always need to have, whether it was the commission or the coalition, which we now reverted back to, and we believe um, in the event of any other situation, the coalition can always be the comparable entity whether um, that's identified even under President um, Obama's proclamation. So one of the things that we've had to pivot to, but not necessarily um, change our focus was having a land management plan, tools that could allow us to continue to um, advocate for those ways of life that we are elected to protect. So that's a small glimpse of, of how um, Regina's comments on the foundation of our healing really continues to be our foundation because if we don't have that, we would have been split. Um, there are times when leadership changes. And of course, um, sometimes with leadership changes, you don't always have that continuity of information or that institutional knowledge on why something happens. So sometimes even among tribal leaders, we do have in our own education moments, if you will, with other tribal leaders to explain to them why this fight is important and why their presence should be continued to um, be maintained with the coalition. So those are some of the things that we try to support and continue to advocate for, even with fluctuating um, uh, administrations from other tribes. But we, with the foundation being healing and, and trust, um, we've been able, able to overcome some of those administrational changes. And moving forward, we've had some really great advocacy efforts and sit downs with uh, not only Secretary Holland, but um, now, Assistant Secretary Brian Newland, and not only barriers, um, advocacy efforts, but also with uh, Chaco Canyon, 
and of course, Grand Syracuse as Toronto National Monument. So those are all areas that we collectively hold sacred as, as Zunis, but um, for me to speak to it specifically, I would have to make my own associations to that landscape, whereas other people with, or with esoteric information know those things inherently. So um, that's a little bit of, of what I can hope to add to the conversation, uh, but uh, thank you. Yeah, great points yeah, and, and info that you highlighted for us. Um, you know, something that you, you spoke on was how leadership changes, right? Um, and that's something that for tri tribal nations, you know, some of our, we all govern ourselves differently and some of us appoint leadership, some of us have elections and we vote. Um, and, the, and some elections are every year or appointments are every year and some of them are every two or four years. And so there's that turnover within tribal um, leadership, but also within state and federal leadership, right? And something that folks have talked about throughout the series is how um, when, when new leadership comes in, you know, it's like you starting over and having to re-educate uh, new decision makers on all of these, um, on all the work that folks have been doing as far as um, sacred land protection. And so those are one of the bigger, one of the, one of the big problems um, when it comes to tribal consultation is that, um, you know, there's not that uh, consistency of educating decision makers and land managers when it comes to engaging with tribes. And so that's something that needs to be addressed, I think, um, moving forward, right, is really, um, again, you know, there's a lot of land managers that reach out and ask, well, how can we be better? You know, how can we be better um, allies or how can we work better with tribes? And really, it, it, I think it requires them to do their homework, right? Like, again, all of our tribes are different and we all govern ourselves differently. We have our own protocol, our own etiquette, our own ways of knowing and, and our own connections to the land. And so it's very important for each tribe to have that space to, to share their teachings and to share their knowledge. And so um, I think this is one of the really beautiful examples also of the Bears Ears model is how it really expands on that. And it makes spaces for every tribe to really come to the table and, and express themselves, right? In a very whole, um, um, authentic way, the way they, the way they perceive themselves and, and the land that they, that we all share here, right? And I think, um, yeah, again, there was historical tensions that existed between our tribes, but I mean, this again, moving forward, we all know that this healing and working together and being collaborative is the only way that we can move the dial and move forward. And so this is really part of the ongoing conversations and the work that I think we're all doing across the board. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Carlton, for sharing that with us. It's absolutely important. So I want to go ahead and uh, move on to our third question. And this one is for Davina. And this is um, kind of a long question. So let me read it kind of slow. <laughs> um, Indigenous voices have been the driving force behind the creation of Bears Ears National Monument, an impressive feat of organizing and action. In contrast, the 1996 proclamation establishing Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument gave little attention to present day native connections. And while native represent, uh, representatives gathered with agencies to discuss culturally significant locations prior to designation, tribal voices were not and are not included in management beyond minimum federally required consultation. So, what work needs to be done to elevate and incorporate tribal voices in, into Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments management? And that's a big question. <laughs> I'm going to direct that to Davina. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I get stuck with the, the big question, right? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I'd love to um, introduce myself. She'a Davina Smith and Shia. And also, I just love, I uh, also wanted to just um, uh, give my respects to Regina and Carlton. Um, these two are amazing people that I look up to as well. So I'm honored to be sitting among them as well. Um, so in, uh, it was actually on the, the day of inauguration um, for uh, president, um, the current president, that I get a call and um, I was informed that I was uh, voted in as a board member for Grand Staircase Partners. 
um, it was an emotional day on all levels that day, right, for everyone around. And for me, it was finally, um, uh, it was something I can't even um, explain, um, twisted. I cannot express how grateful I was because it was finally um, that opportune moment to become a part of something that we could create change. And that is how can I be a better supportive um, board member for Grand Staircase because that conversation including involvement of tribes was never brought to that table. So in September 18th, which is gonna be the 25th year anniversary coming up in 17 days, Proclamation um, 6920, in there, yes, tribes were never brought to the conversation. Um, I remember this is one word that still bothers me to this day where it indicates dignified natives. Um, that was not a conversation that tribes are involved to, to be a part of um, um, implementing support and giving um, perspective or giving their, um, their narratives. So moving forward, um, and working with Grand Staircase partners, although we're waiting on the redesignation, we're wait, waiting on you know the some revisions, the suggestions of proclamation. What can we do to move forward in bringing tribes to the table? Uh, a, a few weeks ago, we were able to have to begin that process. We were able to bring tribes on a virtual, uh, our very first uh, virtual listening um, session and hearing from all of them and getting their perspective of, okay, now's that time to move forward and what can we, what are some steps we can take? For me, you know, I know there's a lot of history in that area, in that location. I have the honor of walking to that area as a board member and um, knowing that, you know, when I look at a certain plant or knowing there's a possible uh, connection to this site or a, a ceremony or whatever that case may be. And I want that to be, um, I want that conversation to be included for everyone to be aware of and respect that location. I am from San Juan County. Bears Ears is deeply rooted in me. You know, it's some, a place that I could seek refuge. It's, um, it's an area that I will continue to advocate for. But in terms of Grand Staircase Escalante, it's something very new. And there was a tribal, um, one of the tribal representatives. The one thing that really broke my heart was that he expressed for Grand Staircase that, yes, we are from that area. And this was Paiute said, but you know, he made it sound like, well, if you need us, we can give you some input. That shouldn't be the case. It should be that they, we want them to be involved. They have every right to be involved because that is their connection there. That is their homelands. And so how do we continuously make them make this these the tribes know that they have a seat at the table, that they are included in these conversations? Um, and that's that is just going to take steps. It's going to take a number of conversations, but um, I'm just grateful that we're, we are moving in that direction to include these conversations in that area, because I feel we need a balance across the board, across um, Southern Utah from East to West. And so um, I feel this is that moment that we can make those happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, again, going back to building rapport with tribes, right? And um, and tribes, too, really taking stepping into that leadership, right? Stepping into those spaces of leadership and, and owning it and making those demands, right? And taking that space, taking up space in those places. Um, that's what it's going to take. And yeah, I, I've also connected with some um, a, a, a Shivowitz Paiute relative who I, I think has worked with Grand Staircase Esquante partners in the past as well, Harlan Featherhat. Um, 
but he did a lot of really, you know, he was one of the folks who was on the ground in the beginning before the Grand Staircase Escalante was uh, designated as a national monument. He was one of the individuals who really start planting seeds and having really hard conversations with land managers and, and really calling them out, right, on some of the uh, remediation, so-called remediation that they were doing, quote unquote, remediation that they were doing um, with around the monument. Um, but he worked with them and he educated them. And, um, you know, he's one of those unsung heroes that you, you just don't hear about, right? I mean, there's a lot of those across everywhere in every community. Um, but it really is, again, um, I, going back and um, pulling in tribes. I mean, for again, it, there's a lot of distrust, right? When even working with federal agencies um, and there's a lot of trauma too, from just the land loss that tribes have um, experienced. And so there's there's definitely a lot of hard conversations that still need to be had. There's a lot of seeds that we need to plant in land managers and uh, in their hearts and minds. And hopefully we can start building those bridges and really start working together and creating more inclusive spaces where tribes can feel welcomed, right? To participate, but also knowing that as sovereign nations, this is, um, you know, we have every right to be there. And, you know, again, consultation is not consent. And, you know, this goes back to the free prior and informed conversation that we had previously and how this really is resonating across Indian country um, because, you know, we're, 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 we're recognizing um, and taking back and reclaiming our power as Native peoples. And so we're, some, we're in extraordinary times, um, but I really feel very honored again to be with you all here and just to share these experiences and have these conversations and to continue to do the, the good work. So thank you all. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our fourth question. And this question is for all of you. So um, we can go round table style and we'll have Regina kick us off. Um, so this is question number four. Though in the present Western construct, Lake Powell divides the Grand Staircase and Bears Ears cultural landscapes. Some speak of the two areas as a connected landscape. Can you speak to this idea and discuss any implications that uh, that has for how we think about an act regarding tribal collaborative management on these lands? Thank you. Thank you. So first off, in just kind of listening to everybody um, respond to some of the questions, the one thing that I keep wanting to, to bring to everybody's attention are, are these spaces that we have felt disconnected and dis, displaced from all our public lands. And one of the reasons that, and something that I have found, and, and even I have felt this, but we as indigenous people and even as leaders, elected leaders and voices for our, our individual tribes, we don't know how we fit into these conversations. We don't know what it is that our place is within these public lands conversations because of systems that have alienated us in the past. We are trying to maneuver our way to get to know these systems that, that by certain laws and even that may even trigger certain procedures that would include um, more of the tribes that might be geographically closely located to these places, sometimes still get left out of those conversations. And why do we do this? Part of it is, is that the lack of education for our for the tribal leaders really hasn't been there. So within even our educational systems, we've we're just known to be located on the current currently established reservations that we're all located on and anything beyond that in a way we've always been told we don't have a place and we don't have voice or we don't have any business to be speaking about all those areas and i say that because often during the time when we were were seeking the designation and the protection of the landscape of Bears Ears, I was specifically told by elected leaders of Utah that I was a resident from Colorado and I had no business dealing with Utah business. Not knowing that indigenous people have roamed these lands for many, many generations, we've done things that have tied us 
our language, our culture, our ceremonies to this land, right down to how we fed and supported our families. So we ask ourselves, how do we get to a different point? We almost have to re-educate ourselves. We have to figure out ways to educate our leaders, but even more so, educate the elected leaders that are outside of those reservation boundaries. Help educate conservation groups, nonprofits, about what those relationships could look like. How do we insert ourselves into those co collaborative management procedures, establishing and figuring out how do we create this? Because that is exactly what we're going to be doing. We're trying to create those spaces. Ironically, we're also finding ourselves and finding our voices. When really in all essence, we've all been raised to have that voice and to speak for all that which cannot speak for itself. But now we have to learn to share that with people outside of our people and other, other indigenous native tribes in and around the area. We have to bring each other along rather than trying to get in a front to lead. We need to bring one another along to create those, those spaces and to teach one another because really when it comes down to it, collaborative management, when you look at the canyon walls and you look at the diverse groupings of people who left their marks behind, it has been done. We're relearning. This was not one language that was um, put on these walls. It was many people, many people for many time periods. But if you look at that, some of those, that information that is on those walls, it could speak about waterways. It could speak about the wild game trails. It could speak and have recorded events, traumas that have occurred within the people and with one another as different um, indigenous groups. So really collaboratively speaking, we've had it, we just need to reawaken it and we need to share it with those who might not know about it. How do we do that? One step at a time and together. Beautiful. Thank you, Regina. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Davina, I, can I go ahead and shoot it over to you next? Thank you. I definitely, definitely have to agree with Regina. Um, in the work that we do, um, for me, grow, I've never wanted to see um, lines. I mean, I think my first impact of seeing that division was in when in 1974 when HPL was implemented, um, and my grandmother the late Catherine Smith was a part of the uh, Navajo um, resistors. Um, she would, she would communicate with Hopi, you know, and uh, we'd go to Kotskomovi and, um, and then there was this line, this division that was created. And there was then this mindset of, oh no, you're on my land now. And it, from there, it just, it, it developed. And the one thing it, that I hear in my work that I always try and implement and, and keep that mindset is that this is this land, Mother Earth is not for us to own. We are all here to take care of her. We're, but also we're here to, to bring that awareness or to advocate or to um, unite in that aspect. Um, so when the, and so the work that I do, whether it's Bears Ears and the, the Lands Between or Grand Staircase, my hope is that, as Regina said, it's one step at a time, but working together to unite um, and to help. Like for my for Diné people, we 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 can be very stingy and and feel like, oh well, you know what. There's history. We used to fight with that tribe. And, you know, just like I heard, like we fought with you. And I'm like, wait, well, I have some relatives that are you, you know? And so it's like, we, we get along now. We can joke, you know, but we need to, con we need to continue and break down that historical past where we are all here. We all have to work together because we're, we're against a bigger um, barrier. And that's 
the national government. That's the federal government. And, and so, yes, I agree. And, and of course, in our, in our, our curriculum, our education system, um, critical race theory, they're trying so hard to, to ban it, to per, not allow it for, you know, to be implemented in these schools because they, they don't want to know the real history, you know? So in terms of, of what we do to create these, not to create these barriers is definitely to work within our indigenous communities and, 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 and educate them. That's for me, that's, that's my responsibility to educate my community, to educate my people or to educate within even my own chapter and let them know we need to work together. You know, what is F about? You know, it's, it's, it's we, we work together, balance and harmony. If we don't have that, you know, then we may as well be defeated, so. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Davina. Now you hit on a lot of really good points too. Um, critical race theory, that's something we talked about in our last session as well. Um, and just how, you know, this is a part of erasing the truth, but also the continuing erasure of native peoples and indigenous peoples or just the global majority in general, right? Um, and so that's a part of the conversation too, is really dismantling white supremacy. I mean, it's, it's, it's huge, but it's a part of the movement. And that's really, I think one of the root, the root uh, goals here is that um, it has to be dismantled for, for, uh, for the global majority to, to regain our power and for the earth to really regain that balance, honestly. I mean, this is why we're in such um, terrible times now with climate change and, uh, you know, it, it's horrendous, but um, it comes from this horrendous way of thinking, like you said, that of, of thinking that you can own the land and, and indigenous thinking and indigenous thought, we don't own the land, we live with the land and we are stewards of the land. We have a responsibility to the land. Uh, we consider the land our family, you know, and what happens to the land happens to us because we are the land. This is how, how integrated we are with our land. And like you said, this is native land. I, it doesn't speak English. It requires each of our languages um, for it to to step to to heal and to really um, providing heal, healing energies for all of us as native peoples these sacred spaces is where we go to heal and when they're desecrated by extractive industries by looting by vandalism what have you then that really hinders our ability to heal from these spaces um, and for our future generations to also be able to utilize these spaces in the same way. And so for those reasons, again, it's very important for us um, to continue to do the work. Uh, thank you, Davina. Um, Carlton, would you like to add to that question, please? Thank you. I really like uh, Regina's comment about you know, what is expected of a tribal leader when they show up to a consultation meeting. And I think that's initially one of the, I guess the hardest things for, for an incoming tribal leader to understand, especially when uh, I point back to my own experiences when I first got elected to Zuni Tribal Council, you know, I had an understanding or a concept of what Zuni and our ways of life were. And even though there were plenty of opportunities for me to know and understand more in depth, it was my lack of you know, Zuni language that kind of made me hesitant to go down those esoteric realms. Um, but I can tell you that in, 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 uh, once I got initiated into my society, my medicine society, I understand that um, <laughs> you don't really want to be a part of a medicine society in Zuni. It usually means that um, something um, either bad happened to you or um, there's a bad, really bad, uh, premonition about you so the society is there to extend your life if you will they're there to protect you so that way you can reach whatever your life's path intended path is i mean as of course there's many trials and tribulations but intent is you know if you dedicate your life to bettering yourself you will reach the end of your your path in, in, in some form or fashion so when when i'm looking at that and, and the knowledge that i've gained from that um I'm still not sure if, you know, what I put out forth when I show up for a tribal consultation is, 
but I do know I will speak to these exact same things and the importance of why this information is important. I guess my, the most recent one I, uh, I was able to do a consultation on is uh, Montezuma Castle. It's, it's south of Flagstaff, but you know it's it's being able to actually go up into the, to the um, dwelling itself and, and see firsthand, you know the the handprints left or left behind in plaster, uh, and see you know all the things that they use to build their homes and understand that that is my connection. That is a part of who I am. And the, the cultural leaders that I was with, they you know that was probably the one chance in their life they could get to visit this place in, in, in the, the detail that they did. And what they said it was, you know, it was the tribal consultation part. It was an elected leader showing up that helped effectuate that. And being a part of it and learning and sharing not only my own experiences, but learning and hearing from my own cultural leaders, that was irreplaceable um I'll, I'll speak to you know like a, my grandfather he was a rain priest and i always felt you know intimidated by his his role and, and his, his his just familiar with any language I, I sat down with him once and asked him to do a prayer for me and i thought you know like, he's gonna tell me to come back he's gotta think about it no he sat down and did a 20 minute prayer and you know i was, I was holding the recording like oh man i'm getting tired but I didn't want to lose that moment. Um, there are definitely other people like that on a reservation and they can't be bothered. And what I mean by that is their whole focus is on ensuring the safety and well-being of Mother Earth and the world. And they elect people like me to um, take on that role and take on the headaches of, of, of interacting with the federal government. So what I can say is that each time I've gone to those locations, I've learned a little bit more and it's given my cultural leaders that opportunity to learn even more and share with me and do that organic sharing of, of, of traditional knowledge that is the intended purpose of what we're trying to effectuate right not only the protection and preservation of traditional cultural knowledge but the continuation of it you know i didn't understand what it meant you know when my society leader said i want you to know the songs because i want you to sing it the same way 100 years from now our society should be able to do that. And so those are some of the challenges that despite um, some of the things that we face, um, I feel that's the role of, of elected leadership is to make sure that those consultations happen. So that way the practitioners can continue to learn and effectuate what their own type of what their way of life is. And so in, a, in the same doing, <clears throat> When I'm put in those situations, now I realize that, you know, uh, it's a concept, you know, like I go there, I go to Montezuma Castle, Bears Ears, Mesa Verde, Chaco Canyon, Salt Lake, um, Gila Cliff Drummonds, Casa Grande, so all these locations, Tuesday Good National Monument, all these locations that we go to, they all have certain um, connection, I, I guess, underlying themes, if you will. If you know what to look for, your ancestors will leave those messages for you. And so in, in that process, you know, it does become overwhelming and the responsibility seems daunting, especially when as a tribal leader, you have about 20 other priorities, but this is one of your priorities. So we try to find different ways to split all those priorities and all those times, because even at the same time, yes, we believe that's important, tribal consultation to be there, we're gonna be there. All the everyday things take sometimes priority um, and we're not always able to effectuate that, but those moments that we're able to do that and allow our cultural leaders to learn and share with me, um, I need to be able to do that. Back to our youth. So I believe those are some of the things that when we're trying to effectuate um, effectively, we can make great things happen. Um, for those of you that are familiar with our documentary uh, in the Grand Canyon, it's, called, it's on YouTube now. Uh, it's called Zuni in the Grand Canyon, then now and forever, about 27 long, 27 minutes long. Um, and there is some, certain information that might have been considered esoteric once, but now collectively we have agreed that we will share this because it's important for our youth and our people to understand. And at the same time, it's a way for us to educate the non-native, non-Zuni communities and why this is important. So these are all things that uh, I guess when when I said that um, we're, we're expected to sing in the, 
the same songs it's the same way a hundred years from now. When we gather, we go to those moments and um, there's there's times, you know, like when when we have to do a, a, a sing to maybe our prayer sticks, there's not there's not a there's not an audience per se. You know, there's members of the house of the lodge that take care of the house and then the society members are there, but it's not like my leaders and my brothers are are slacking. It's not like they're expecting that, oh no, it's just there's no audience, you know, we'll just we'll just go through the motions. No, it's you're here, you you, you put in your full faith effort. You 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 stay awake, you you sing as hard as you can, you shake your rattle as hard as you can, you make sure you're following along and make sure you do your part. And I realized that, you know, when, when I plant my prayer sticks at that point, that those songs are going over to the other side. You know, what it, you know that, that's the audience. My ancestors are my audience. And so realizing that it is, you know, hard sometimes, especially when the natural resources wise, access to different types of birds and feathers are one of the reasons why we continue to advocate for public places, places because those are some of the areas that some of these things can exist. Because sometimes our, even our own relationship with our own government, um, meaning BIAs in the agency, sometimes some of the projects we went on now affect us. We have about four dams and four reservoirs that need to be filled before the Zuni River can flow. No, nobody thought about that 30, 40 years down the road, but now we have a reservoir that can't even be filled. So those are some of the impacts that we try to I, I guess navigate and tell the federal government, you know what, you 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 have these regulations, you may you think you may be doing what's what you think is best, but it's not because I have a history that says it's it didn't work for my people. So a little bit long-winded, but those are some of the ways that we're trying to uh, I guess effectuate and figure out what meaningful tribal consultation is. And but more and more now that we engage in this type of capacity, I realize um that is becoming more meaningful and becoming more effective. Why? Because if that person or that federal agent he represented now understands inherently what tribal members feel and we share it all the same way at the coalition, now they can go out and they have it in the back of their head, maybe I should talk to a tribe. Wherever state I'm from, maybe I should talk to a tribe first. So those are some of the, the ways that we've seen and interacted with different agencies here in Zuni and um, some of the ways that we try to share information and um, and the ways that we do it are, are all uh, in different capacities and there are, there's so much Zuni information and um, I'm just glad that I have cultural leaders that are willing to share and impart with me certain information because in order for me to get the full picture of Zuni, I probably need to be part of a whole bunch of different societies and I don't think I have enough um, feathers for those prayers. So. Um, but that's a small uh, again, uh, I guess uh, I'm trying to be concise in all the different ways that you know we were challenged in how to advocate for these places. But um, that's 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 my um, that's my contribution to that question. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Carlton. You hit on a lot of really great points too. Um, you know, the fact that our cultural leaders are already. Um, you know, uh, inundated with their own responsibilities as knowledge keepers, right? And that they don't have the capacity um, sometimes to get out and, and teach others about what, what, what this piece of land means to us, right? Or to the tribe or to the, to the community. Um, and there's protocol and etiquette that goes into that, right? And so it's different for every tribe too. So that's something that we have to understand. And this is the beauty, again, of all of our traditional knowledge and all of our traditional knowledge systems. They're very unique very unique and and you know we have the spiritual traditional knowledge keepers that um, have a tremendous responsibility to um, pass on this knowledge and you know there it's it's difficult there's a lot of um, it's very complex and how we and how that transmission of traditional knowledge um, occurs or is implemented and that's another thing that um, one of the dynamics that comes up when we're trying to um, get our peoples out into the land and reconnect with our, our sacred landscapes or even to um, identify 
where our sacred landscapes are within so-called public lands, right? Um, it's difficult. And again, a lot of our uh, tribes don't have uh, the bandwidth, the resources or the capacities to get out there um, and, and to do that work. And so it really does require um, our, our allies, our friends and people who uh, want to work authentically with tribes, right? And so there's a lot, it's very complex. And again, this is why it's important for land managers and decision makers to do their homework, um, to know how to build rapport with tribes and to really make that space to listen, that's, that's crucial. And so, um, and again, for tribes to really step into that leadership is also a very big part of it. So thank you so much, Carlton. That was a lot of really great, um, really great points that you made. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our fifth question. And this is again for all of our panelists and we'll kind of go round table, round table style like we just did. Um, so let's go ahead and kick off the fifth question. Uh, throughout the past several weeks, our panelists have discussed the promises and limitations of existing laws and policies, such as free prior and informed consent, tribal sovereignty and frameworks such as rights of nature and land back. Can you share examples of how these could be utilized specifically within the context of protecting and stewarding the Colorado Plateau? And we'll go ahead and start with Regina. Thank you. Wow, you got some wonderful questions here. You know, I think for me, something that I have, have experienced in um, several different places and, uh, and it's interesting that I would have come from being an elected leader and serving in such an honorable capacity with the coalition um, and then turn around. And that led me to move on to going to pursue my education um, and finish up my master's degree, but also to join a um, land conservancy um, group here in um, Southwestern Colorado. One of the things that I have learned and have kind of felt a little odd, and I do want to tell everybody this, if you feel uncomfortable, then there's work being done. If you feel like nothing is moving and you don't feel like your resources are, are being tapped within yourself, then I would start to ask questions. If we are not uncomfortable, we are not doing any work. We are not moving any needles in any direction, good or bad. So that I want to say first off. And then secondly is what a lot of people need to understand is when past policies were put together in the best interest specifically of, of um, federally recognized tribes, not always did our leaders understand that, especially prior to, I would say, even as, as late as the, the mid 70s, maybe early 80s. Some of our leaders were very, very traditional in the fact that they spoke their languages. And when they spoke their languages, they spoke it in their tribal um, chambers. So when the agencies were coming to a lot of the tribal groups, some of that language was getting lost in interpretation. And so when we think about how, how do we take specifically like the, the, you asked about the free and, in, or the prior and informed consent. I don't know that any of my leaders could even say that they've had any real um, encounters with that or had even thought about having any discussion beyond what is starting to pop up today. So when you start to think about what and how it's been presented in the past and how a lot of these discussions are entering into our, our tribal governments and how are they affecting groups in and around the area that are trying to, to put the work together, how can this move forward in best providing those, those opportunities to help steward the land? And the only thing I can say is helping one another to understand each other, helping to figure out where we are in terms of how much we know and what our education is about these specific areas. I don't, I can honestly say that tribal sovereignty, just because the tribes will continue to say it is our right 
to do certain things based on the fact that it's our tribal, our, it's our sovereign right. That doesn't mean that the federal agencies are always going to entirely understand what that means, or our federally elected leaders into um, the national level and even at the state level. My experience is there is so much that we don't understand and how we use them both ways is so sometimes disconnected, but sometimes is lost in interpretation. How do we bring that forth? Again, is helping educate one another, helping to make sure we're speaking on the same page and in the same language. Sometimes even English language has its own language within it. And so I think we need to make sure that we understand one another so that we can have those conversations that are of the same. And then we can move forward together to begin to work in a better collaborative way by understanding what we're talking about. Thank you. Talia has asked me if I can go <laughs> right after you. So, um, you know, I think, this question I had to think about um, carefully and how I'm going to respond uh, because I might ruffle some feathers within our own Diné nation. Um, and it's something that needs to be said because there needs, we need to, we need a right or wrong within our own Diné nation. Um, we've had this long ongoing division of Utah Navajo versus the Navajo Nation, you know, we're referred as just Utah Navajo and we're being left out of out of the conversation of Utah or with, with Navajo Nation conversations. And so when seeing this type of the work that's happening between Bears Ears uh, in, the, in the lands between or Grand Staircase Escalante, it's a lot of Utah that's that's involved you know we have um our commissioners um uh, willie gray eyes commissioner um kenneth murray boy um and my my uncle um james adekai who was a former commission on bears there's intertribal coalition so we have that support system and so in terms of this kind of work, you know, yes, we want to bring in the Navajo Nation, but there's that that division, there's that barrier. And so we do seek, we do seek a lot of support from the Navajo Nation president, but how well enough do we know that we can continue with, you know, support of getting that support in terms of free prior informed consent or tribal sovereignty? Um, so I, you know, that's a, that's a question that I'm still, it's a, it's a good question, but how, I don't know how we can continue to move that forward when we're having those issues within our own tribe. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of um, dynamics too within the organizing, even within tribal communities, right? Um, and, and that's something that we have to navigate. Um, and there is that discomfort. Yeah, I really appreciate Regina bringing that up because that that is it, it's a part of the work and it, it is it is out there, right? Um, so thank you guys for touching on that. And those are really really important. Um, Carlton, would you like to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. You know, when we look at you know, pre and prior and informed consent. Um, Throughout the Southwest, tribes have always had that issue. You know, we're not seen as, for a while, we we're seen as a resource, right? As, as you know, as we fell under the Department of Interior. Um, when we looked at, uh, I guess that aspect of it, you know, when were when were we identified as people? When did we start getting those kind of those rights back? And I guess it's always been difficult. Um, throughout the Southwest, mainly because they have different interactions with different European governments at first. So when you look at um, Pueblos and, and Pueblo nations, um, we look at our first um, European contact being the Spanish. And even though we, of course, had our issues with them, um, their, their manifest destiny, you know, more or less, was to claim land for, for Catholicism and 
and eventually souls. So when we looked at the establishing of missions throughout the Southwest, it eventually became not only a fight for um, souls and resources, but also a way to secure um, Spanish route to um, California. You could travel up to Mexico, Arizona, then make, eventually make your way to California, while at the same time maintaining certain connections to um, your resources. <clears throat> so from that point on, we've always been privy to what other people say we should be practicing. You know, we we had we have had we had to move a lot of our remove a lot of our shrines. We've had to move a lot of our practices underground, and literally underground. Meaning, there's um, within the old Zuni village, there's certain hatchways and certain areas you go. You can go down into um, really the old parts of the village where there's even still the the old T-shaped doorways. Um, so those are still um, apartments and, and buildings that exist even under modern Zuni today. Um, so those are, um, and the people will say that when the Spanish um, were, were really around that they could hear singing down in those lower chambers, meaning people were going down and meeting in certain locations to continue our way of life. So <clears throat> when we look at prior and informed consent, we were never allowed that. And throughout uh, the Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian Institute's um, excursions throughout the Southwest, a lot of them um, were really disrespectful in how they gathered information. I mean, they were very, um, they, were, they were very blunt. Um, they, they would basically camp out in someone's house until they got the answers they needed. Um, and, you know, we, we have, and of course, at certain times we, we allowed them to, um, allowed them, I guess, into our way of life. And even then there was a betrayal. You know, the classic example is uh, Frank Hamilton Cushing. You know, he became one of our Bow Priest members, um, society members, but at the same time, in the end, he still went to the Smithsonian and created um, kachinas and replications of, of uh, deities that we hold sacred. So we still have um, those issues, and, and it's hard, especially understanding that, you know, when um, my, my job in the military was, was dealing with classified information, and we understood that once classified information got out of top secret, secret channels into what's called open source, meaning the regular internet, you can't take that back. It's very hard to limit access and control to that type of information once it gets out into the internet. So those are some of the ways that we're trying to identify, I guess, copyright laws and, and, and reel back some of the information. Um, I want to real quick uh, respond um, to a question that I saw Robin Kis uh, Cascade he was asking, um, um, can, panelists, can panelists share their perspectives related to when and how they believe sharing knowledge is beneficial to protecting Mother Earth? And that when it feels too much of a risk or exposure of the sacred, given a history of disregard, betrayal, abuse, and appropriation by white settlers. So I, I guess when we look at that, what we've experienced here in Zuni and what I have uh, as, as my library is all the different Section 106 and compliance reports we've done in different projects and I guess that's where our issue is. The government can say, oh, there's this project, this project, this project, but they won't pay for the in-between, <laughs> you know, right? So yes, this location is very similar to this location, but why don't you make that connection? I guess that goes back to the Grand Staircase and the Bear Jewish connection. You know, we see it as one landscape. We see it as one cultural landscape, but the government always sees it as, well, no, that's private land, that's BLM land, that's Forest Service, that's the state land, that's Utah, that's Arizona, whatever the case may be. So those are some of the issues that we see. Uh, and so when we share some of this information, some of it has been clear and vetted. Uh, most recently, what we've done with the um, Bears Ears Land Management Plan is um, when we when I sat down with my cultural leaders and, um, and we went over the report, basically almost line by line, you know, they said, we know this isn't going to answer every question for answer any every question for you. But these are your guiding principles. These are what you will always have to guide you. No matter, and, and even if you endorse a project, as long as you say you took into these considerations and you have an answer to why you endorsed it or supported something, then we will be satisfied. Meaning what I asked them for was, what do you what do you need me to say? And they say, we need you to say this all the time. <laughs> so here's your guiding principles. And so now that I have those guiding principles, which also include very crucial elements of not only cultural and the understanding of our history, 
um, but they did it in a way that can be shared, not only just really, not just for the, the, the federal government or whatever agency is asking for it, but for, for me, for myself and to our tribal leaders that are always asking them, hey, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Okay, here is your guiding picture. You need to know this. So that way, whenever you come and speak to the federal agency on any of these components, here is your guiding principle. Here are your marching, marching orders. So that is a tool that I now have that I can utilize to share um, why Zuni is important in any different aspect. And so when we share this information, we always feel, and you'll, you'll, you'll find it across many tribal nations and many tribal leaders, they want to see you face to face. They want to see you interact with them. Why? Because I need to know, are you listening to me or are you just taking this information and, and saying okay and nodding your head so that way you can go back to your boss and say, yeah, I did my part. And they seem really interested. Or, okay, we have a long going issue. We're going to develop something and we're going to make sure that we include you at every step of the way. You know, those are some, some of the things that we always ask for. We may not always get it, but that is the intent and that is basically my marching order. So those are some of the things that um, we share and how we try to share, but it, it's all about the audience. If you continue to show up and you continue to show me that you are worth sharing this information, you will have access to certain information that, um, I don't know how to explain it, it's worth it. You know, when, when I mentioned is tribal conversation becoming more meaningful? I, I, I say it is. Why? Because my cultural leaders are saying it is. They're telling me that, you know what, your 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 presence allows us to do some things that we weren't able to do before. And so that is my indication that it is becoming meaningful. And I don't care if it's meaningful for the federal government or not. I need to be meaningful my people. Do they feel that they are getting the treatment that they deserve when they show up to a federal agency for a consultation? And more and more we're making that happen. So those are some of the ways that we not only have information that we are willing to share, but we also have those mechanisms for choosing who to share with and how much we share. So um, those are, uh, I guess, ways that we try to make sure that we um, be more effective in how we share this information. And the reason why I say that again is because um, over the past COVID years and even during any regular number of years, our, our elders are elderly. Anything could affect them, and you know, even even going down the who knows, even going down a, the road to to get something from the store, anything could happen. We can't live in fear, but we have to be cognizant that somebody else's life is limited, and if we have a chance to capture their information, we have to keep that chance right now. And the best way to do it is for me, for me myself, and my leaders to go and talk to them and Zoom. And so now more and more, now that I'm speaking to them, uh, my elders in Zuni, they're responding and us akeho, us akeho, yam and devia That's how I've become peaceful and that's how I add to, I guess, my, my heart's feelings, I guess, in, in, in um, dealing with this. Because it is stressful, of course. You're going to have those moments where you don't feel you have anybody to talk to, but it's when I'm speaking to my elders and it's not really just about words, it's just about how are they feeling. And they respond to me and they're proud to talk to me. That's what gives me that, I guess, that motivation to continue. Like, ah, let's, let's put my personal feelings aside. Somebody else is, is expecting something from me. So, thank you. Yeah, that is beautiful and powerful. Thank you, Carlton. I, there's, there's so much there. Um, you know, I think across everything that you all have shared was really hitting on free prior informed consent, right? And that's why it resonates within Indian country so much right now is because we do want that, um, that knowledge ahead of time, right? We wanna be able to see these people in person. And you were absolutely right in how native peoples wanna, we wanna meet in person. We prefer that, right? We want these land managers to come meet us where we're at, come to our communities and meet us where we're at. Um, and, and no bogus phone calls, no you know little ad in the newspaper um, saying you're having a public meeting for public comment or whatnot, um, come out to our tribe and meet with our tribal leaders, meet with our decision makers and, and give us the information that we need and want in order for us to make better informed decisions for our communities and our families and for ourselves. 
And so that's really what it goes back to, right? And all in all, it, it really is like human rights. We all have uh, the right to clean water, land, and air, and this is really a big part of it. And having access to our um, cultural, spiritual, sacred places um, so we can heal ourselves, this is absolutely a part of it. And so thank you all for sharing those uh, wonderful perspectives, and you guys touched on a lot of really great points. Um, we have about 10 minutes. I have one more question, and then I want to try to get to some of the questions in the Q&A. So um, thank you, Carlton, for answering Robin's question. Uh, there's another one. Let's go ahead and try to answer these questions here. How do we understand BIPOC or racialized people in relationship with indigenous peoples and the land we are on that is obviously not our own? Would anybody like to try to answer that? It's the first question on the top. And I think I see Davina wanting to. <laughs> what? <laughs> really? Put me on the side, I was just smiling. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, sorry, repeat the question again. because. I okay. How, how do we understand BIPOC or racialized people in relationship with indigenous peoples and the land we are on that is obviously not our own? You know, I had to take, I had to step out of, step out of a box in a sense to say, um, in terms of visiting an area that I have no connection to, but in knowing that it is indigenous land and I, um, a few months ago, I um, had the opportunity to travel to Atlanta and I hiked um, Stone Mountain. I, that location, I don't, it was, it was intense. You know, it was like, it was like basically a 12 on the treadmill and your incline. And as I was on top, it was so emotional. Knowing I know that that place could have, is a sacred place of what was then um, homelands to Oklahoma or to um, Cherokee and other tribes. But of course, during the Indian Removal Act, they were forcibly relocated um, to Oklahoma. And so how, you know, and I, and I was among some non-Native, I was actually um, with some um, um, a black, some black friends of mine who invited me. And so as we were on top, you know, I was talking about this location, the location, I said how they're, you know, just talking about indigenous connections. And they wanted to know why is it so important for me to be connected to Bears Ears? Like, what does that feel like? Um, because one, one, one person, oh, I'm gonna get emotional here because she said, I don't have that connection. I was forcibly taken from my homeland, my motherland in Africa. So I don't have no connection, you know? So what is that? What is, I wanna know what that feels like for you here. What is, give me that experience in Bears Ears or Grand Staircase or even where your umbilical cord is buried in my valley, you know? You're, you talk about, as a Deneb woman, when a baby's umbilical cord falls off, your mother immediately buries it to Mother Earth. What does that feel like? Because I don't know what that feels like. And, you know, I can only give my, my perspective. I can only give my, share my story. That is why, that is what we do, you know, to, to hold space for those that, that, as she explained, doesn't have connection. That's what she's feeling. But I said, of course you do. You know, despite what has happened, you have connection. Again, Mother Earth is not for us to own. The land is not. It's for all of us. Um, and so it, it, was, it was a powerful conversation. And that, that is my message. That's on my ongoing message to today. That's why I share that. I can only share my perspective. But that's what I want to bring for everyone around that's non-native that's BIPOC that they have that they are connected to mother earth so thank you so much for sharing that Davina yeah absolutely you know indigenous peoples and the global majority um we understand and that 
it's it's in our blood memory, I think, right? I mean, this this knowledge has been passed down through oral history and blood memory. So I think it's within all of us. Um, and it really is really just, I think, getting back into the land and making those reconnections with the natural world. Um, and that, yeah, thank you for sharing that because there are spaces um, here within our tribal homelands um, that are meant for that healing specifically. So, you know, for all of us, we're sharing this land now. And so that includes what happens to the land is also impacting our relatives who are non-native, right? And I think that's, we're all seeing that now with climate change and people's eyes are opening and they're starting to understand what native peoples have been talking about for the longest time right and the and the red flags that we've been trying to show people um, all along and so thank you for sharing that Davina um, uh, there's another question but before we get to any more questions let me ask my last question to you all um, and this is question six if you were to look forward a few generations and your ideal future for the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase regions had been realized, what would it look like? And let's start with you, Regina. Thank you. Thank you. And this is actually gonna answer a little bit of the last question. Um, and it's something that I've had the honor of, of, of helping to provide a little guidance to. And it's, it's kind of funny because I think I'm still a baby um, in response to a lot of the, the, the ladies, or I should say the women of Bears Ears, the voices of their, of, of what they really have expressed and have, have felt has been um, something that's helped carry me over the last few months. And one of the things is rematriation. If we really want our future generation into tomorrow and beyond, we really need to help them to return back to our mother earth, to realize where their origins come from and, and just basically our return to life and the ability to live, to be able to celebrate, to be able to be together, to be able to join in ceremony. You know, one of the things that a lot of our indigenous people worldwide have is they have their societies, they have their individual groups that, that are closely tied to specific cultural um, events and doings. And that's something that the women have really talked about and it has deeply impressed upon them. And that's to help to lead the next generations to restoring some of that balance, the values, the honor, and, and helping to build those leaders that are gonna be up and coming speaking for this how do we do this? We keep supporting the families. We keep singing our songs and we keep talking. We talk amongst each other. Do we talk to each other? We help support each other through difficult times. And one of the places that we all return back to to achieve some of that sense of healing is back to our mother earth. And a lot of us, we, we, we journey back to sacred places. Um, some of us, have a long history of our people being guardians of places that are sacred to other other tribes like the Utes the relationships that we have with a lot of the Pueblo Puebloan structures you know we we have kept them sacred we have kept them away and protected them for a lot of years but now we're coming into a time where we must share we must not only share with one another, but we must share with the people that are not of our people. And that's to help create that resilience. This is how we're going to keep that knowledge. This is how we're gonna keep our identities and ties to the land. And with everything reimagined in, in the policies and seeing what collaborative management may look like and what it could lead to, it'll lead to a better way but it'll help us secure our ties to the land just the same way that our ancestors and our grandparents have done long ago. And we'll keep it together. We'll share with one another and we'll keep going down this road and revisiting places like Bears Ears, helping other indigenous 
people realize they do have a place in conversation to continue to share and regain those ties and reestablish those ties. We can help those in and around Grand Staircase to be reconnected. That's how we'll lead into tomorrow together. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. Davina, would you like to add to that question? Gosh, Regina just said it so eloquently and everything that, um, gosh, that I definitely look forward to that perspective. Um, the, what I can add is that, um, you know, the, the work that we do right now in looking forward a few generations, um, unity, unity is just, that's what I see. Um, we can't do this on our own. That's why we, we need to continue to work together. Um, Regina mentioned something about um, being in, in these, these groups. You know, for me being uh, among women of Bears Ears, it's such a healing uh, moment because I get to hear their perspectives of their stories from their tribes and and it just gives me so much more hope and it gives me a rejuvenation. It gives me a charge um, as a, you know, as a Diné, we're, we're from a matrilineal society. And it reminds me that my first clan is um, Tkachini. And I, I can carry that on for future generations. Um, you know, like maybe a few years, like Davina, you know, remember Davina Smith I was like, yeah, you know, just I'm a part of that conversation, but I get I say that about my grandmother and my grandmother before her. So um, I just I think the most important thing is that we we break down these barriers of these divisions that um, our colonizers have implemented. And um, I, and so I, I, I can't even, I don't know what else to say. I'm just. Um, grateful to be on here. Thank you, Davina. Thank you so much. Uh, Carlton, would you like to add to that last question? Oh, that's, uh, you know, like when, I don't know, like we, you're so used to maybe getting bad news all the time, but you know, I'm optimistic. So what does it look like? I, I guess when I look at bears ears, what do I want? Um, in the future, I would say we would have our 1.9 million five acre national monument that we propose to Bears Ears or to President Obama. We would see a full restoration of the Bears Ears Commission or the Bears Ears and the Travel Coalition, whichever the case may be, and that we would have a land management plan and there would be meetings. One of the things that I would also imagine that I would have already done, or at least a tribal leader would have done in my capacity, was share some of this information with you. Um, I saw that the uh, Zuni in the Grand Canyon video um, link got shared out. Thank you for that. And I imagine something um, similar to uh, Bear Gears being done um, in that capacity. Uh, mainly because of when you look at the, the, the um, carrying on of traditional knowledge, it's not, I, I can't do it alone. You know, when, when you look at the youth and, and their responsibility, they don't know it's their responsibility yet. They don't understand that it's their destiny. And that's where we're trying to make sure that they understand that. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> during this healing process, I've come to understand um, the importance of why my people, why my family wanted me in the society and what the expectations are now that I am part of the society. It's a lifelong obligation that you just can't put aside. And so, when I look at that and I look at the acceptance of that and and now that I understand what all of that entails, I have the rest of my life to try to effectuate that way of life. And I have a goal, I guess. Uh, I know that's not going to be easy to get there. It's, I, I don't know when my path ends, right? I just have to do what I can do, get as far as long as I can. And I guess that's where I, I appreciate that. And, I, and it goes back to, I guess, the core of our, our prayers and our, and our songs, and that's the resiliency part of it. 
And you know, the truth of the matter is that, you know, when I look at it and I look at this work, and I've said it before and I'll say it again right now, is that I do this work so that way our youth can understand their importance. So that way they don't have a reservation mindset, like I gotta leave here or I have no place here, or if it's so bad here and I can't even get away, maybe my path is to meet my parents sooner. You know, there's unfortunately, you know, some kids that, you know, have lost, even before COVID, you know, like they may have lost their, their parents or their role, um, role models through either alcoholism or some other destructive mechanism, right? Self-destructive habits that you should put aside because you have obviously have people that care about you. Um, but for whatever reason, sometimes we don't. And I need them to understand how precious they are. So that way, no matter how bad it gets, they can continue trying to take that next breath. Because, you know, on one hand, we have some people that survived COVID and they're, they're excited. They want to get the vaccination. They're pushing forward. And then there's some people that maybe have lost some family. And that's all they can think about is, how do I get to mom and dad? I miss mom and dad so much. Maybe I'll go to the, to the cemetery. And maybe I'll go see them even though that's not really part of our, our traditional ways. Back in the old days, once you left the home that you um, had your final wake at, you got buried somewhere and nobody knew, knew where. Not until the Spanish brought graves and the concept of graves. And, and so I, I think that allows some people a peace of mind because they're not gone. They're there. In, the spiritual form and the way we believe it is if we have rain or moisture comes as any other thing or if the casino comes out still with you and that's how we can be at peace not going to the cemetery not going and, and having a physical place to go to that you know draws your i guess your, your spirit of your life if you will you know there's a saying that you know if you grieve too much for the dead that you're reaching out to them eventually once they reach out to you and you connect, there's no, there's nothing that they can be done in this world for that person. They're just gonna do what they can to get to the other side. And that's not what anybody wants for us. That's not what our ancestors want for us. They survived many things and they show me that in the structures they built. And so I'm hoping that through this process, our youth can understand how precious they are. So that way, even though they may be on a reservation, there's still opportunities and there's strength and pride of being who they know they are and they know what their destiny is. Their destiny is to speak the language and do what they can to greet the, greet the father, son, and take care of mother. And there's certain ways that we say it in our own languages that makes it more impactful. And that's something else that we need to work on is making sure that our kids know how to understand that language when it's spoken to them. So those are some of the things that when I look at it, um, I'm gonna have kids that know the name for their years, they're gonna go and they're gonna be able to show me things that I haven't had a chance to see. And hopefully I'll be able to share something with them in a place that I've been to before. So those are some of the things I envision. And of course, we'd all hang out at the um, Institute of Traditional Knowledge Traditional Knowledge Institute and share this information in, 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 in the spirit that's intended. And when we trust each other, we know which respect is and that our message will be received. And it may not be effectuated today, but eventually, somewhere down in the future, you'll remember the words that we spoke and then you're all gonna wanna do the things that we said we would do. So those are uh, it's a, a vision of their years, you know, that it continues to be a place where we continue to share and involve and not, people not, uh, other than myself, can go there to be healed and, um, and continue to be resilient. So, a little bit of, of uh, my vision for their years. So, thank you. Yeah, did you want to hear it? Thank you, Carlton. That was beautiful. Yeah, and I think that's a great um message to end with there uh, we are at the end of our session so we do need to wrap up um and again i just want to 
give my heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists throughout this teaching series. We've had an amazing, um, amazing group of native leaders from across Indian country, from across the Colorado plateau who joined us in these spaces to share their perspectives, their knowledge, their wisdom, their experiences. I'm forever grateful. Thank you all for, for coming together and, and having these hard conversations and answering these hard uh, questions. And um, just real quickly, there was someone who asked, how do we feel about the Umatilla tribal leader, Chuck Sams, uh, who was nominated as the National Park Service Director? How will this impact relationships with parks and monuments for tribes? Well, hopefully it'll be good, right? <laughs> as a native, as a native person coming in and to this tremendous position, you know, National Park Service is um, one of those agencies that is very much a part of tribal consultation, right? And they they need to do better. And it's great that we have a native person in that position who can hopefully elevate and amplify uh, the aspirations, the the ideas, the, the, the needs of all of our tribal communities. And so um, I'll, I'll share that much for now. But yeah, I think it's great. Uh, and it's a, a good move for, for Indian country. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. I would like to close with a couple of quotes um, just because I couldn't I couldn't just pick one um, for this finale. <laughs> so let me go ahead and read off a couple of quotes um, to close this out. Is it better to have less thunder in the mouth and more lightning in the hand? This is from the Apache tribe. And then here's a few more. The holy land is everywhere. This is from Black Elk. <clears throat> I have seen that in any great undertaking, it is not enough for a man to depend, to depend simply upon himself. This is from Teton Sioux Tribe. Um, and just a couple more. <laughs> we will leave known forever by the tracks we leave. This is from the Dakota Tribe. All who have died are equal. This is from the Comanche people. And one more, all dreams spin out from the same web. This is from our Hopi relatives. Thank you all so much for joining us in this wonderful teaching series. Again, I'd like to honor and just say thank you to all of our beautiful, wonderful panelists and leaders throughout this series. And um, I look forward to another series in the future and um, bringing back another amazing group of Native leaders. So thank you everybody for your support. And um, I look forward to um, doing the good work and fighting the good fight with all of you. So thank you very much. And thank you for tuning in. If you would like to view any of the recordings, please visit Grand Canyon Trust's uh, YouTube channel or else uh, the Grand Staircase Escalante Partners YouTube channel. You can also go to our websites and visit um, uh, the, the videos there and um, please share them. They're uh, hopefully gonna be an educational tool for all. So thank you all for tuning in again and uh, take good care. Have a great evening. Thank you all, uh, take good care.